Hi, thanks for joining us for The Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. I'm Chris Cooper. Today we are catching up on answering viewer questions. We have questions about tomatoes, ants, armadillos, and more. Questions and answers are ahead on The Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. Production funding for The Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South is provided by Goodwinds Landscape and Garden Center in Germantown since 1943 and continuing to offer its plants for successful gardening with seven greenhouses and three acres of plants plus comprehensive landscape services. International Paper Foundation. The WKNO Production Fund. The WKNO Endowment Fund. And by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to The Family Plot. I'm Chris Cooper. I'll be joined by many guests today to answer some of your garden questions. Every week we get more questions than we can answer on air. We post answers to all the questions we get on our website, familyplotgarden.com. So, here we go. We are starting off with questions about animals. I'm having a terrible time with ants around my sidewalks and flower beds, but don't have any flowers in them. They're also in my strawberries along with slugs destroying them and my lettuce. How can I get rid of the ants in my flower beds? And this is from Elizabeth. So Lori, what do you think? How do you get rid of the ants in your flower beds? Well, rather than bringing out the big guns to start with, you know, um, <laughs> right. you, I mean, you can spray something on them. It'll kill them for you sure, can. but um, it'll kill a lot of other things yes. too. And so what I would try is maybe peppermint oil. Ants don't like um, okay. the, the mints. They're they're pretty strong, and you can mix it up with some water okay. and just take a you know get one of those sprayers and and just right. and try that and see if that won't take care of them. Um, they'll just move elsewhere because I mean they do good good work out there too. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. you don't want them on your sidewalks and around your windows and stuff. That's right. Okay. Um, we have problems with ants with bees, and what we do is we will use cinnamon around the inside of the box covers. The ants will go up, they hit cinnamon, they don't go in. Nice. Wow. So peppermint, cinnamon. Yeah. Hmm, it's in a pattern here. Okay. Mm -hmm. Nature. Yeah, nature. Hey, yeah, something else I would do too. If, if you disturb the area enough, the ants will move off. You know, if you must, I mean, you can use you know one of the ant baits. Amdro is is something that you can use. Let them f feed it to the queen. Mm -hmm. She becomes sterile, doesn't reproduce anymore, and of course the colony starts to die off. If you want to go that route, but the natural routes sound good to me. But if you disturb the area enough. They'll move off. Because they'll get in plant pots too, and you just keep watering. You know, you overwater the plant for a couple of days, the, the ants move out, and then you can let the plant dry out and okay. kind of get mm. back to where it needs to be. What is the best way to kill, get rid of Japanese beetles? I have dusted with seven dust, but they have returned, and guess what? They multiplied. They are everywhere. And this is from Miss Shirley in Bartlett. So, Andy. They are everywhere, these of Japanese beetles. Are. Of course you know, they are. They're an invasive exotic yes. species with few natural predators. Yeah. Uh, and although I'm, it, it, you know, I'm fairly adverse to using herbicides and pesticides, mm -hmm. you can make certain, certain exceptions. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, but, uh, you know, like, uh, but timing is everything. Mm -hmm. You know, you've got to consider the life cycle. You know, most uh, beetles spend most of their life as a grub underground. That's right. And uh, during, like, particularly in the winter or this cooler weather, the grubs go farther down underground, and you, you know, you can't blast them out with a, a nuclear bomb. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, but uh, uh, the, uh, typically, the best time I believe to get both the adults and the grubs near the uh, surface tends to be uh, isn't it July thereabouts mm -hmm. uh, when the yeah. grubs are, are right right about breaking now. dormancy and right. Yes. right about now. And the the, uh, the uh, apparently the adults will you know they feed during the day and then the females go right down to the mm -hmm. ground and lay the eggs and right. and that this time of year is when they're most susceptible. That's right. Mm -hmm. Yes. Do I? Yeah. I, well, and one thing we've got to understand is that they give off a pheromone. Mm. And so they keep attracting more, they, they, you know, to yeah. the same area. And if you can collect them, or if you, you know, if you see them and you pick them off, what you need to do is put them in some soapy water. So yeah. apparently mm -hmm. that will uh, eliminate the pheromone from uh, for attracting more. 
And but yeah, it's just repeated. They're they're mm -hmm. everywhere. They I've, are. I've also heard if you use those pheromone traps, they're really good about attracting them to the area, but not trapping them. Right. Right. Yeah, and, and yeah, so, they say not to. Yeah, that, to yeah trap. they tell you not to you know, yeah. trap yeah, for that reason. Don't trap. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, but of course, you know they they eat a lot. You know, it's, it's not just yes. the one Japanese beetles. They right. invite all of their friends, mm -hmm. and then, yes. of course they eat between the veins. You know, I have yes. roses at home, and and they can just skeletonize yeah. a rose leaf. Yeah. You know, um, but if you you can do that with the soapy water early in the morning because, you know, they're a little slow and sluggish yes. early in the mornings before they it starts are. to warm up, just knock them in a mm -hmm. bucket, you know, or a little saucer or something, a soapy water. Mm -hmm. And there are some pyrethroids. I mean, to me, that's the last result yeah. Uh, yeah. That, that you can use. Uh, yeah, because and it's not going to last. It's not going to last. It's only right. going to get what's there, and then his neighbors, his friends are going to come that's right. the next day. Yeah. So, right. it's, so it's not going to last. But, yeah. you know, a couple of those would be like bifenthrin, yeah. uh, permethrin, deltamethrin, cyfluthrin, mm -hmm. you know, some of those that you can use along with carbaryl if you have to go that route. To me, that's mm -hmm. last result. Um, but, yeah, they're... They're going to be out there. Yeah. You know, they feed on, what, 300 plant species is what I've read before in the past. So. Yeah. And you have to be vigilant. You know, you, you, if you're successful one year and get rid of them, well, next year you start, here we go. Start you start start fresh. My gardens are battlefields. <laughs> I like oh, that one. I like that one. Yeah. I did too. <laughs> I won the rabbit invasion for now. <laughs> But have a new problem. Something is uh, rooting up, uh, rutting up my gladiola bulbs and late tomato plants. We suspect our resident armadillo. <laughs> These are not being eaten, just pushed up and left. Could yeah. we be right? How do we stop this armadillo from destroying our garden? And this is from Cass, West Tennessee. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> Mr. D, armadillos might be rutting up. Yeah, I would plants. ask Cass. I wonder how he was successful in handling his rabbit invasion. <laughs> that would, yeah, because sometimes I would like the to know same, that too. Yeah, sometimes the same tools for handling oh, rabbits boy. will also work with armadillos, and I'm especially talking about the 12-year-old uh, with a 20-gauge yes, or course. Yeah, rifle. Yeah, scatter you know, Of course. Uh, take care of that. Uh, but, uh, you know, that's probably, it sounds very much like what your problem is, mm -hmm. armadillos. They're, 90, 95 percent of their diet is, is insects, right. so they're not, they don't really like a lot of uh, uh, you know, <coughs> plant material. They will eat some fruits and things like that, but they prefer uh, uh, insects and, and uh, grub worms and earthworms grub and worms, things yeah. like that. Uh, uh, you know, you can. I would suggest try to trap it. Mm -hmm. You know, because. They are active mostly at night. You know, rabbits, on the other hand, are, are <laughs> a crepuscular. They are very active, you know, right at dusk no. and then right at dawn. So that 12-year-old might see them. Unless he's out there in the middle of the night, he might not see that armadillo. Uh, but uh, you can use a, a, just a regular live animal trap and put you some wings on it. I've, 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 this little publication yeah, from Prevention and Control of Wildlife Damage has an illustration. Uh, and th those, oh. those wings are, are simply made from uh, uh, one by sixes. Okay. And if you do this, armadillos are, are curious enough, you can set the trap and you really don't even have to put any bait in there. They, wow, they will that? bump, they'll find those wings and sometimes they'll go right into that <laughs> live trap without bait. You can use bait if you want to, use uh, fetid meat, you know, uh, you know, stinky meat. Or, you know, when you uh, said wings, I thought you meant like chicken wings. Well, oh, chicken yeah, wings. You're just hungry. It's getting close to lunch. You're just hungry. <laughs> uh, but but that uh, is is probably as good a way as any to to try to get that critter, and uh, that way you don't have to stay up all night and with a with a spotlight. Yeah, trying to, try to get out. They're very interesting critters. You know, if you catch one in a trap, don't handle it. Uh, yeah. They carry the the bacteria that causes leprosy, mm -hmm. so it's very important that you do not you know handle. <laughs> armadillos unless you wear good rubber gloves and, and things like that uh, but uh, they uh, they have one litter of critters per year and uh, little babies and they're the they have four uh, quadruplets there's one one egg that that's fertilized and and they have four identical quadruplets yeah, little clones, little clones. they are yeah. they're little yeah. clones that's why I, I, have you ever seen a different looking armadillo <laughs> Some of them are flatter than others right. on the road, oh, but wow. they're yeah. all pretty much yeah. the same color. Yeah. They're pretty much, they look alike. They have one the same expression looks on like the face. Other. That's right. <laughs> but uh, but if you've got one out there, you know, if it's a female, you may have five. Wow. You might know it. So okay. you, know, you need to try mm. to catch, catch, catch her and, and get rid of her. But the other, now, another thing you can do, it's a little bit more expensive. You can uh, try to exclude them from your garden with a armadillo 
exclusion fence. Uh -huh. Now they can climb fences, they can swim, but if you build a fence and you angle it out at about 40 degrees, okay. they can't climb up and, and, and you know, that 40 degrees. That? So you can use fences can to exclude under? them from your garden. They can burrow yeah. under it. So you may have to do a little, you know, you have to sink it in the ground a little bit. Wow. Hmm. Uh, they probably got several burrows around. They don't just do one burrow. They usually have <coughs> several burrows, so they have an option if they're running from something to go to, you know, in different directions. Oh, how about that? They like to be around rock piles okay. and brush and weeds and things like that. If you've got it, you know, that's probably where the burrow is if you if he has any of that around his garden. All right. They want to just clean that up. A worm or something has been eating my tomato on the vine. What can I use to kill it? And this is from Mr. Smith. So a worm is eating the tomato on the vine. What do you think about that, Mr. Tom? Well, he says he thinks it is, I believe. Right. He thinks it's a worm or something, <clears throat> but it's eating the tomato. Okay, and uh, from my experience, I find it's usually birds, mm -hmm. uh, especially in the heat of the summer where there's no water sources like that. Uh, normally, they get their water from worms, grubs, and stuff like that but exceedingly hot, they go to ripe tomatoes and they'll peck it to get the, the moisture. And my cure for that, if that's the problem, mm -hmm. is to, uh, I don't let the tomatoes get ripe on the vine. Okay. I always pick them up where they're, they're turning, but still firm, hard, and I let them finish ripening up on the kitchen counter. But uh, as far as worms go, I think you had mentioned something about a worm. Right. Uh one of the words that came to mind to me was the tomato fruit worm. Mm -hmm. It actually eats the foliage and it eats the fruit as well. Uh, you know, little green worm, brown worm, mm -hmm. uh, it will actually bore inside of the green tomato. Right. Oh. And it pretty much eats the insides and uh, it's, uh, it eats a lot, you know, for the most part. And BT will take. And BT will take care of that. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. So I would stop at using BT. Don't worry about anything else. BT, Bacillus thuringiensis, Dipel. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, a it's, brand name. it's a brand yeah. name for BT. Javelin uh, is another one. Thuricide is another one as well. So just use a BT product on that. Uh, it gives, of course, the fruit worm a stomach ache. It stops eating. It dies. I still have not figured out how to pronounce a BT. <laughs> just takes a little practice. Mm -hmm. There are a number of gardening events going on in the next couple of weeks. Here are just a few that might interest you. Every week we answer all the questions we receive from viewers, but we don't have time to air all the answers on TV. This week we're catching up. Now for some questions about plants. I have what everyone tells me is nutgrass in my flower bed and have tried several things to kill it, but nothing works. Is there anything I can get to kill nutgrass without killing my plants? I would be willing to kill my plants if necessary. And this is uh, Miss Abigail in Somerville. So she'll be willing to kill her plants if necessary. If that's the case, there's several things that you can use. <laughs> but the reason, uh, the reason this, this, this nut grass, as she called it, is so hard to kill right. is it's really not a grass. It's a sedge. It's a sedge. And uh, sedge. therefore, a lot of the grass materials, most of the grass materials will not touch it. That's right. And... Um, uh, we do have a, a weed control guide, a ornamental uh, weed control mm -hmm. and, and flower bed mm -hmm. guide that's several years old, but I, I printed off one page of it. And uh, just to kind of give you an example, this is page 25. And across the top, there are 16 different uh, herbicides listed. Mm -hmm. And it's got a key that tells you what herbicide is listed. And then down here, I have circled the sedges, <laughs> and if you look across that list, you'll see N, 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 yeah. N, 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 that means none, 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 none. But if you notice over toward the far side, there are two or three products. One is good, you got a G for good, and mm -hmm. one is E for excellent. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to tell you what those are, <laughs> right. and, and that way you don't have to kill all your plants in your flower bed. That's right, we don't want to do that. Uh, the first one that's listed as good is number 11, that's Bassagran, hmm. product that's uh, uh, been around for quite a few okay. years, and it, won't, it will not hurt broadleafs. It's routinely used in uh, 
uh, uh, soybean fields mm -hmm. over the top of soybeans to take out some of the some of those products. Uh, also, uh, one that's listed as poor. I don't even. I'm not gonna tell you that one. Uh, excellent is uh, number fourteen. That's manage. Manage, manage uh, is listed. And manage is actually now sedge hammer. Sedge hammer. That's what it is. Sedge hammer. And that's Stop the one that's excellent. Run. Okay, yeah. so that's probably that, that's mm -hmm. that's the one. I, that's probably the one I'd grab. Right. Uh, the other one that's listed as good is fifteen is Roundup, and that is not true. Absolutely <laughs> not true. Roundup won't touch it. Yeah, I mean, just it just kind of burns it, it back. It yellow right. a little bit, but right. so really, there's only and you know Sedge hammer. Sedge hammer. Like and there's actually another choice. one. I'm surprised it's not on there. It's uh, image. Image. Which uh, the active ingredient is. Uh, Imazequin, I think is what it is. Is that right? Right, image, hmm. which the homeowner can get, and it has pretty good control on your sedges. Hmm. It's image. This must, I don't see it listed. That, so that, that herbicide is not even listed on here. Okay. So this, this, this is uh, a few years old. Right. So yeah, just uh, yeah, be careful with that. Follow the label. Follow the label directions. Right. Or you can always try to dig it out. Uh, I do a lot of digging. But that uh, be good, good, good luck with that. <laughs> I found this growing at the base of my pin oak. I pulled it off and threw it in the trash. Will it harm my tree? And this is from Milton. So, Mr. D, you think it harmed the tree? I think I might know what that is. I'm not sure. I'd have a certified arbor see it. Probably is what I would do. What? You can do that, but it's Ganoderma butt rot. That's what that is. Will that harm? That, that, that could. Ah, uh, that means could. death. Uh, it's pretty much what that well, is. Because a certified arborist, they yes. come in and cut it down. And, you know. Yes, because it, it will actually infect the, you know, the roots. And once it starts doing that, once, once it gets to that stage, it's, it's too late, you know, at that point. But you usually see like dead branches uh, reduced in the canopy of the tree yeah, for the you most see part. Snags right, you see snags and things like that. And that's, so that, that's a uh, tip of the iceberg is what you're saying. That's fun, uh, a fungal infection. Right, it's fungal. Yeah. Right. So that's that's yeah, pretty much it. You know, you usually see them. On, I've seen them on maples and I've seen them on oaks. Hmm. Right. Does the tree have to be injured to to it's usually, get an infection? You know, it's usually stressed. You know, stress. It's stress. some kind of a secondary. Yeah, it's so secondary because it's stressed for whatever reason. Lightning, maybe. Lightning, that water, probably. you know, soil compaction or something like yeah. that. But it's usually stress, and then here comes that. So that's not good news. That's not good. Yeah. Mm. So yeah, I would get a certified arborist out there and uh, you know assess the damage, but do know that this means certain death. Yeah, that could be three, five, ten years. I don't know, but. On the yeah, bright you don't side, really know how advanced yeah, you know, no. it, right. it is right now. On the bright side, red oak makes great firewood. <laughs> okay, right. mm -hmm. great firewood. Yeah, okay. Glass half full. Right here. <laughs> there you go. Mm -hmm. My Japanese maple Acer Blood Good has lost limbs of leaves. I read about verticillium. Is there a simple way to confirm whether my Japanese maple has verticillium? I already tried a granular treatment to kill soil pests with light fertilizer. Previously had a Yoshino cherry in the same spot that had to be removed several years ago due to similar symptoms. And this is from Ray right here in Memphis. So, Doc, what do you think about well, that? Well, I think... It lost its I, limbs yeah. and it may be verticillium. Well, well, let me tell you the more likely thing that's going on right now. I bet you we're thinking the same thing. Go ahead. Yeah, because, see, I have a Japanese maple in my yard. So do it I. is in full sun, and we have had some really intense heat with wind mm -hmm. and not adequate rain spread out enough in, in increments that would, you know, keep the soil or keep plants watered okay. evenly. So my tree has done the very same thing. Whole sections have lost their leaves. And my experience has been just to water it. When you see that happening, just okay. know that that is from environmental stress, more likely than verticillium. Okay. And that Japanese maples really do better, especially the ones that blood good would like some shade. shade. Mm -hmm. It will really do better with some shade because when this intense heat of late summer comes on with wind, with the which wind, we've had which wind, makes it, tough. Right. it has really right. desiccated those leaves mm -hmm. and you'll get that edge of the leaves curling up and then you'll get leaf drop. 
but I've had that tree almost completely defoliate before I even knew it, being the expert horticultural right. person you that I am, right? not even <laughs> noticing what's going on in my own yard. And I went out there and watered it real, real, really well, and it will leaf out. Okay. But, you know, just make sure that this doesn't go on for year after year after year. Notice and be aware that when it gets hot, dry weather with the wind blowing, be sure and water that tree, especially if it's in full sun. Right. Okay. And of course, we don't know the conditions because he didn't tell us. But no. Yeah. Yeah. I had the same problem with mine. Yeah. Yeah. That happens. It does happen. Mr. D, anything to add to that? Nope. That's Absolutely. What I think. Everybody Everybody factors. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. With the, uh, that being the environment. Can you spray fungicide on your tomatoes while the sun is shining on them? I would be afraid of sunburn to the plants. And this is from Matt, and this is actually uh, YouTube. So this is a YouTube question from Matt, so we appreciate that. So he wants to know if you can spray fungicide on your tomatoes while the sun is shining. Well, for one thing, like neem oil, which is, in my case, the most successful fungicide I've used. Okay, good to And know. Uh, usually you spray that, uh, and if it's sunny, it will have a tendency to burn the plant. Mm -hmm. So it's recommended to uh, spray them early in the morning mm -hmm. so the plants will dry before the sun comes up. My preference is I spray it in the evening <clears throat> uh, before I go to bed or the sun's still up or it's setting and I'll spray it at that time. That way I don't have to worry about the sun bothering it. Mm. Now about some of the other fungicides like Dacanol, uh, I'm not sure. But uh, just, just like the neem oil, if you have any doubts, spray them in the evening. Then the uh, foliage will be dry way before the sun comes up. And that's my recommendation okay. for that. Spraying the foliage for the most part. Right. Just want to make sure uh, and, that and it does dry off. And normally, too, when you spray, you want to spray it to the point where it's dripping. Mm -hmm. All right. And for read sure. the label on that as well. Yes, I always absolutely. read the label on that. We purchased a house that has a small pear tree. It bears fruit, but the pears never ripen. They remain hard and green. What can we do so our pears ripen and are edible and this is from Miss Betty and we actually have something in common with yes. Miss Betty. We yes. both have pear trees have and pear have trees. the same the problem. They, they yeah. have the same problem. Right. Yes, we do. Uh huh. Well, uh, one thing she's got to understand is that actually pears ripen after they've been picked. Mm -hmm. So you really need to pick the pears and then put them inside with, um, sometimes people put them in brown plastic bags yeah. so that they'll all have the be together in there and keep the gases that help them ripen together. Uh, or they'll put them with other fruit. Right, yeah, because I actually put ours with uh, bananas. Bananas. You know, you have the ethylene gas mm -hmm. that releases that helps ripen the pear. Mm -hmm. uh, but the thing about pears on the tree that I've noticed from mine that I've had for some years now, they seem to ripen from the inside out. Yeah. You know, so it, it, it does make it hard to kind of figure out what's going on most of the time. But yeah, we just pick them off you know, early enough and then just put them, you know, in a, a bowl full of, uh, you know, bananas and it seems to work. Yeah. And mm -hmm. mine are still hard. Okay. Even though yeah, they look yeah. ripe, right. they're still, they're not what you call an eating uh, kind of pear. Right. I, I, mine I do better with when I can them or preserve them or okay. cook with them. And they're that kind of a pear. Okay. And so that might be, since she doesn't know what her variety right. is, that might be the same situation too. It could be. That they're, it could be. A little harder pear. I mean, they're still good to eat, you know, but they're, oh, they are crunchy. What is this black stuff on my holly leaves? There are also some large white bugs on them. And that just so happened to have what I think may be mm -hmm. the answer to the question. We can probably find it within a block anytime we take a walk. Oh yes, and it was mm -hmm. found within a block. <laughs> was it? Uh, for the most part. Mm -hmm. The black stuff that you see on the leaves, of course, is sooty mold. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, the culprit here would be the cottony camellia scale. Okay, it's a white scale. The females have the ovisacs. Okay, and of course, underneath those would be the eggs. The crawlers are out now. This is the time we used to see the crawlers. Um, they're soft scales, mm -hmm. and of course they suck plant sap. Mm -hmm. They excrete honeydew, and then on that honeydew grows the fungus, mm -hmm. black sooty mold. I know, people want it diagnosed as, as a disease, but you yeah. have to kind of explain that scale is an insect, and it that is, is the insect. residue 
once it sucked the sap, that the excrement mm -hmm. provides a substrate for that sooty mold. That's right. And then so the, the remedy is to get rid of the insect. So you got to get rid of the scale. Yep. Use oil. Horticultural oil mm -hmm. would do the trick. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't like using all the harsh stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, if you use, uh, it'd have been better if you could have used dormant oil early in the season, mm -hmm. but now you can use the horticultural oil. That'd be fine. Mm -hmm. Get good coverage underneath the leaves. I think that works. That's good. You hey guys. Remember, we love to hear from you. Send us an email or letter. The email address is familyplot at wkno.org and the mailing address is familyplot 7151 Cherry Farms Road, Cordova, Tennessee 38016. Or you can go online to familyplotgarden.com. That's all we have time for today. Keep sending in the questions. To read extension publications about any of the questions we answered today, go to familyplotgarden.com. Thanks for watching. I'm Chris Cooper. Be sure to join us next week for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. Be safe. Production funding for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South is provided by Goodwin's Landscape and Garden Center in Germantown since 1943 and continuing to offer its plants for successful gardening with seven greenhouses and three acres of plants plus comprehensive landscape services. International Paper Foundation The WKNO Production Fund The WKNO Endowment Fund and by viewers like you. Thank you.